like because of what they can do. Maybe it's basketball, maybe it's art. Personally, I always look up to and admire and wish I could be a little bit like the professors for the classes that I'm currently taking. Now that's pretty nerdy, right? Is that nerdy? Yeah, super nerdy. But I love how these guys talk about theology. I love how they talk about Christ. And someday when I grow up, I'm going to be just like them. So usually at some point in our life, we have someone we look up to and admire. In chapters 8 through 10 of 1 Samuel, it's clear that the people of Israel wanted to be like someone else. 1 Samuel 8, 19 through 20, we covered it last week. Let's look at it real quick. It says this, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So who did the people of Israel want to be like? Yes, all the other nations. Chapter 8 ends on a little bit of a somber note as the people of Israel demand that they be given a human king. They wanted to be like all the other nations instead of recognizing that God was already ruling over them. So in chapter 9, which we're focusing on tonight, we're introduced to the future king of Israel. This is the man who is going to make Israel like all the other nations. And his name was? Hey, there we go. Okay, so we're going to read this passage. We're going to take a little bit of time to do it. It's a long passage. But what I want you to know before we get into anything else tonight is this passage is a lot of fun. I just love it. There's a a wild goose chase. It's a wild donkey chase, but it's sort of like a wild goose chase. There's a feast. There's some interaction with a prophet. It is super exciting. So I need seven of you to come up here to help me read it. Five guys and two girls. And just the first five guys and two girls to come up here who can read. Um, reading is a prerequisite. Bring your, bring your Bibles. Bring your Bibles. Bring your Bibles. How many do we have? One, two, three. We also, we also can't count. One, two, three, four, five. Wait a second. Five and two. Okay, here we go. Okay, so there's seven characters in this chapter. And I'm going to assign each of you a character. So line up. Can you get you all to line up? Maybe on that side over there. Just line up facing the audience. I'll give you a character. And when we come to the character in the story, you're going to read what the character says. I'm going to be the narrator. We'll try to figure this out. So you are Kish. Okay, what's his name? Kish. Kish. Okay. You are Saul. You got it? You're the servant. Yeah. Who's this? This is the servant. Okay. Next. Oh, well, I'm going to skip. You two at the end are the two young women. They come in a little bit later. And then, ooh. I'm still trying to find it. <laughs> First Samuel 9. Okay. Well, I was going to, so one of these guys has to be the Lord. And um, it's not going to be Callum because he can't find it. So you get to be the Lord. And um, obviously you're not the Lord, but you're going to read the portion that God speaks. And then you, Callum, can be, who do I have left? Samuel. You're Samuel. Okay, here we go. We're going to give it a shot. You guys will have to read it nice and loud, and I'll try to cue you. So, there was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becherath, son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. I don't know how they figured that out, but... Saul was a handsome young man. Who's, who's Saul? Saul, can you raise your hand? Oh, my goodness. I picked the wrong guy. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. From his shoulders upward, he was taller. Nope, that's, okay, wrong guy again. He was taller than any of the people. Okay, listen up. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. 
This is where the wild donkey chase comes into play. So Kish said to Saul, his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise and go and look for the donkeys. Back to me. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Shalim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuth, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about it. But he, the servant, said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in the city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says is true, so let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us where we, we, we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, The servant answered Saul again. Here, I have with me a quarter of shekel of, of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer. For today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servants, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, Saul and the servant, say, Is this here? There we go. They answered, young women, can you do it together? Great. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Samuel answered Saul, Saul answered, Am I not a Benjamite, Benjamite, from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is, my not, and is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about thirty persons. And Samuel said to the cook, So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof. And he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Okay, very good. Okay, little test for all of you. Who is this? 
Gish. Okay, who is this? Paul. Next. Servant. Next. Servant. Next. Servant. Next. Servant. Samuel. Samuel. There we go. And last. The two ladies. Okay, you guys can sit down and give them a round of applause. Thank you. So I hope, I hope that through that, you see there are so many interesting things that were going on in this passage. But we need to ask right now, why is this passage in Scripture? Or what's the point of this passage? There was a lot going on there. But why is it in Scripture? Why does it matter to us? I believe that the main point of this passage can be summed up in three words. Are you ready? Here's the main point. God's in charge. God's in charge. Yes. Yep. I cheated a little bit. Three words. God's in charge is the main point of this passage. So about a year ago now, God brought two foster kids into my home. You may have met them. They're here tonight running around like crazy. See them back there. And um, because they're here, I thought I should highlight that... um, They look cute, they look cute, but they're actually little rascals. How many of you have already even seen that tonight? You've seen that tonight? Yeah. Just the other day, they gave Ben a gift for his birthday, and as Preston was handing Ben the gift, Preston opened it up because he thought even on Ben's birthday, the gift was for him, and there he is. See, the world revolves around toddlers, at least that's what they think. And so one of the first things that I've tried to teach them is that God's in charge because toddlers and all of us tend to think that we're in charge and the world revolves around us. And so many times throughout every single day, I ask them a question and um, they may answer if they hear it, but I ask them this question, who's in charge? And the answer that they're supposed to give is God's in charge. They're figuring out what that means. They think the world still revolves around them. But what I'm trying to teach them is what this passage is trying to teach us tonight is that ultimately God is in charge. All of scripture teaches us that God's in charge, but it's particularly highlighted in this passage that we have tonight. So tonight from this passage, we're going to see that God's in charge of the donkeys. He's in charge of the prophet. And that he's in charge of the king. I think that one of the most important lessons that all of us can learn, toddlers, teenagers, adults, is that God's in charge. We live in a world that's filled with brokenness and pain and many things that we cannot control. And many people spend their entire life trying to control things that ultimately they cannot control. The path to true peace lies in practicing glad-hearted submission to the fact that God's in charge. Young people, if you learn that lesson now, it's going to serve you the rest of your life as you live in a world that can sometimes feel like it's massively out of control. So tonight, I think each of us in this room, especially the toddlers, desperately need to know that God is in charge. We're going to take our main points from verses 15 through 22 this evening. We'll spend most of our time talking about that portion right in the middle of this passage, but it's set within the broader story that we, that we already talked about. So this passage begins in verses 3 through 10 with sort of what I've referred to as a wild goose chase, a wild donkey chase. And it's sort of comical. Saul a handsome, wealthy, tall, young man is wandering around the desert looking for some lost donkeys. Along the way, his servant shows more knowledge than Saul because the servant knows about Samuel, the man of God, and Saul didn't. Also, Saul's servant was more prepared than him because the servant had a coin to give to the prophet. In these verses, the future king of Israel was wandering around trying to find some donkeys, and his servant was a better leader than him. That's a bit outrageous and and almost comical. But where does the search for the donkeys lead these two men? This is the really important question asked. There's a lot that's going on. It's sort of funny. 
But where does this search lead these men? It leads them right to the prophet of God, Samuel. So if we stopped reading in the passage right before Saul meets Samuel, we might be left to conclude that everything that's happened up to that point is just happenstance. The donkey donkey just happened to get lost. Saul just happened to meet Samuel. The servant just happened to have a gift for the prophet. Stopping at verse 10 would leave us with that perspective, but when we move ahead a little bit, verse 15 and 16, we find out that God was arranging all of these things behind the scenes. Verse 15 tells us this. Look at it. Verse 15 says, Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be the prince over my people Israel. So a whole day before Saul ever met Samuel, God had already communicated to Samuel that Saul would come in search of his donkeys. And the Lord told him that Saul was the person who was supposed to be anointed as king over Israel. Every piece of the story up until this point in chapter 9 had been a part of God's plan to bring Saul to meet Samuel. God had planned that Saul would be anointed by Samuel at this time, and he used Saul's foolish pursuit of some lost donkeys to accomplish this plan. So what do we learn from this? What can we learn from this? We should learn that God is in charge of even the seemingly insignificant things in our lives. Donkeys may not seem that important, but God used these donkeys to accomplish his purposes. The same God who caused a donkey to speak to Balaam in Numbers was the God who caused Saul's donkeys to go missing so that Saul would meet the man of God and become the king of Israel. Think about how crazy that is. History would totally change because God used some donkeys to bring Saul to Samuel. I'm sure that the search for the donkeys felt a little bit crazy to Saul. What could he do about the lost donkeys? He had searched everywhere and couldn't find them. What he didn't know, though, was that behind the scenes, God was using the loss of the donkeys to accomplish his purposes. Does life ever seem a little bit crazy to any of you? Ever at all? Not many of you. Okay. Well, some of you are crazy, so no, I'm just kidding. Well, okay. Just slightly kidding. Mainly this front row here. But life is a little bit crazy. Does it ever feel like things are out of control? Yes. Feels like things are out of control all the time. Life in 1 Samuel 9 felt like that to Saul. We have the benefit of learning from Saul's life, though. We have the narrator's view of this, and we get to see behind the scenes. And what we learn is that God is in charge of every seemingly insignificant detail of our lives. And this is something that should give us peace. As we look on the story of Saul, we can learn that God's in charge of even the donkeys, and we can have peace. There's no area of my life that's out of God's control, even when there are many things that are out of my control. Ultimately, God's in charge, and he's even using insignificant animals like donkeys to accomplish his will. What might that look like in your life? What things feel like they're just out of control right now? Maybe think about them. And recognize that in those things, God is still in charge. So not only is God in charge of the donkeys, I also want us to see from this passage tonight that God's in charge of the prophet. Think about what Samuel's about to do in this passage. What's he about to do? Anybody? No ideas? What did you say? Elect a king, something like that. Anoint a king. Um, A little less... Democratic, but yes. He was about to anoint a king. Okay, so we read it. We know the story. Israel had kings. This is, this is insane. The entire course of history for the people of Israel is about to change. And Samuel is going to institute this change. By anointing a king, Samuel is disrupting centuries of history. And he's going to transform the future of the nation of Israel. Would you want to take on that task? Yes. Maybe, yeah. Could be sort of fun. But how could Samuel have confidence to do something like that? Did he just wake up one day and decide, I'm going to start a monarchy? No. 
For many years, Samuel had been listening to the voice of the Lord and prophesying in obedience to God. In fact, Saul's servant says in verse 6 that everything Samuel says comes true. Look at it. Verse number 6. But he said to him, this is the servant, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. So for years, Samuel had been prophesying on behalf of God. And he had seen all these prophecies come true year after year after year. And he had absolute confidence in what God was telling him to do. Samuel had seen over the course of many years that God was totally in charge. All that God had commanded Samuel to say had come true. This could never happen if Samuel was speaking by himself. How many of you have said something thinking about the future and um, it's not come true? I've done that. More times than not, it doesn't come true. I like to think about the future. I like to plan. But when I talk about the future, I have to realize there's a lot of uncertainty. Well, when Samuel talked about the future on behalf of God, it all came true. And he had seen this play out again and again and again. When he was speaking on behalf of the one who had control over all things, these things came true. So when the word of the Lord comes to Samuel and reveals that Saul is to be anointed king, there wasn't a question in Samuel's mind about whether or not he should take this history-altering step. Samuel knew that God was in charge and God's word was to be obeyed. Just as Samuel knew that he should obey the word of the Lord, we too should obey the word of the Lord as revealed to us in the scriptures. We have the amazing blessing of having 66 books that reveal to us God himself. Just like Samuel knew that God was in charge and worked to obey God's voice, we also should work to obey God's word to us because we can have absolute confidence in that. You can't have confidence when I predict the future. Can't have confidence when you predict many things about the future. But we can have confidence in everything that the word of God says because this is God's word to us. So when scripture says things like not neglecting to meet together as the body of Christ, each of us should seek to obey God's voice and gather with the church on Sundays. When scripture says things like obey your parents, we should seek to follow God and obey our parents. Just like Samuel followed God's word because he knew that God was to be obeyed, we too should follow God's holy scriptures because we must obey the one who is in charge. So finally, last point, not only is God in charge of the donkeys, not only is he in charge of the prophet, but he's also in charge of the king. So while Saul doesn't officially become king in chapter 9, God makes it quite clear in this chapter that God's in charge of every single thing that Saul and every king after him does. Look with me at verse 16 and 17. Four times in these verses, God shows that even though a king will be reigning in Israel, the people of Israel are still his people and he is in charge. He repeats the phrase, my people, four times. Let's look at it. Verse number 16, tomorrow about this time, I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin and you shall anoint him to be prince. So here he's going to be king, but he's going to be king over my people, Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Even though Saul would be king, God was still ultimately in charge of the people. Hey, crazy kids. God was still in charge of the people because they were God's people. In fact, God had, has always been in charge of setting up and taking down Israel's kings all the way until the perfect king, Jesus Christ, came to earth. Who instituted Saul's reign? God, he's pointing up. Yes, God did. Who was the one who ended Saul's reign? God. 1 Samuel 15, 23, we'll cover it in a little while. Says, Samuel says to Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So God institutes the reign of Saul and God ends the reign of Saul. 
God was clearly reigning all, over all, including Saul, the entire time. Verse 17 of chapter 9 clearly shows us that the Lord was the one who identified Saul and set him up as king. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man. The Lord said, here is the man. And with these words, he identified the first king of Israel. In just a few years, though, the Lord would say nearly the same thing about King David. In 1 Samuel 16, the Lord again said about a future king of Israel, this is the man. Because of Saul's sin, the kingship passed from Saul to David. And it was the Lord who initiated the kingship of both of these men. He's in charge, even over the kings of the earth. For all of time, God has been in charge of kings, and it was through the line of King David that King Jesus came to and established an eternal reign. An interesting thing is said in John 19 during the trial of Jesus. When Jesus was about to be crucified, Pilate echoed these Old Testament words of the Lord, and Pilate said, while looking at Jesus, behold the man. And a few verses later said, behold your king. So in a similar way to what happened in 1 Samuel, God used Pilate to call people to behold the king. And in doing so, he was speaking the words of the Lord that this is King Jesus, who God has established an eternal reign for. It was this King Jesus who lived a sinless life, died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, and rose from the dead three days later to rule and reign for all of eternity. The power of God that we've seen in 1 Samuel to establish kings is finally and fully displayed in the kingship of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is no temporary king like Saul was. The reign of Jesus is eternal. And we should ask, what is the proper response to the reign of King Jesus? Because Jesus is God, the Son incarnate, we know that his kingly reign does not know the failures and boundaries that the reign of Saul did. How should we respond to the reign of Jesus? Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is a helpful guide in answering this question. If you have your Bibles open and you can turn to Philippians quickly, do it. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And it says this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by, coming, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, King Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So how should we respond to the reign of King Jesus? We should bow down and confess that Jesus is King. Even though this is the proper response to the reign of Jesus, many people spend their entire lives as if they themselves are the true King. Instead of submitting to Christ and following him, many people in this world will live for their own pleasure and according to their own rules. For each of us in this room today, I would plead with you to repent of your natural self-centeredness that we talked about, that we see very evident in toddlers, and it doesn't go away. Richard, does it go away? No, and Richard's been doing this for a while. We must repent of our sinful desire to rule our own life, and we must turn to the God who is in charge and who has established an eternal reign through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So just like my toddlers need to learn that God's in charge, each and every one of us sinful human beings need to learn that God's in charge of donkeys, prophets, kings, and every other thing that we could imagine. And what's the proper response to the eternal reign of Jesus Christ? It's falling down in our knees, on our knees, in worship, and professing him as Lord and Savior of the earth. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and I'll turn it over to Ben. Father, as we come before you in prayer, we thank you for your word. We thank you just for the, yeah, just the beauty of the institution of kingship in Israel. And Lord, just how faulty um, the people's reasoning was, but in all these things, we see that you are in charge and leading us to the day um, of us being able to speak about King Jesus ruling and reigning forever. So Lord, I ask that you would help us as we respond to the truth that God's in charge. Lord, the questions that may be on uh, people's minds, the uh, exceptions that they think they can find to the rule, Lord, I ask that um, you would help answer those things through your word and the work of your spirit, and that you would help all of us to repent of our sinful desire to rule ourselves and turn to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, stay seated. It's going to be a little bit different tonight. Surprise, surprise. Ben's giving out a couple.